Excellent. So let's I get started. You just fine. Um, for those of you just tuning in, you probably heard my quick spiel a second ago, but here's what we're going to do. Um, this is Elixir. This is Gear Speak, and I am your host. Um, my name is Ben Ricci. I'm the editor at Performer Magazine, and every now and again, Elixir lets me uh, take the reins and host some of these uh, cool events on their Instagram channel that kind of you know, trust me to do that. So thank you to Elixir and thank you to our special guest today, uh, Sean Daniel. What the Gear Speak series uh, tries to do uh, is bring on really cool guests from the industry, whether they're uh, guitarists or people who work at guitar companies or guitar related companies. We try to talk through some things, you know, maybe it's a, a special technique that we can learn. Maybe it's a gear maintenance tip that we can take away, but we want to get some information out um, to the public and who better to do that than people who know, you know, a thing or two about a thing or two. And that brings us to today's guest, um, Sean Daniel. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you want to maybe just give everybody out there uh, a quick introduction about who you are, what you do, um, and we can kind of take it from there, that would be excellent. Sure. Uh, my name is Sean Daniel. Thanks for having me. I'm a man of the people through and through. Uh, first and foremost, I guess. But most people know me from my YouTube channel, where I do like a lot of uh, stuff, performances, uh, lessons, pretty much whatever nonsense I can kind of drum up. And I've been a uh, I've been a warrior for Elixir Strings for a long, long time. So uh, super happy to uh, be gracing the so, Elixir Strings channel. Right How did you actually first get into guitar? Was it something that you were drawn to as a kid with the music in the house? How, how, how did you get sucked into this world? Uh, yeah, no musical ability in my family at all. I remember when I was in high school, I was, uh, I'm, I'm gonna flex a little bit on everybody right here. Ben, I was so good, I was so good at math in high school <laughs> that they put me in this class with like the seat, there was like five people in this class. It was like me and four seniors. And the whole class was like, we would just teach ourselves math because they didn't have a teacher or whatever. So one dude was like a super hipster and he would bring his guitar in. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like an, an acoustic guitar. I've never, I'd never even really, talk to anybody that like played guitar at that point he's like oh yeah check it out and i was just kind of messing around you know my mathematical mind started working <laughs> and uh i was like oh this could be something that i could actually do because like before i didn't even think like playing an instrument was something like people who didn't have it in their family or grew up with it could even like really do for whatever reason and uh i just i got one i got a guitar soon after that and then i started playing and then probably like in college uh I was like really playing like a lot and then I graduated and I found out I could probably make more money doing guitar related things, whether that's teaching or whatever, than uh, whatever the job market was offering. And eventually it led me to just doing stuff on YouTube and performing a lot. And interesting. you kind of have to get hard a little bit later in life than a lot of folks that we talk to. Um, and you, mm -hmm. you took a different career path. You didn't, you didn't do the, the touring studio guy type traditional, Thing that we think of it when we when we think guitar players especially youtube guitar players because a lot of them come from a, a live touring background or they're studio guys who have you know um, done that thing in nashville or slugged it out in la for decades things like that um where did youtube enter the picture for you because i think this is an interesting conversation a lot of folks out there are looking to get into content creation what was your entry point into into that world yeah, well, I didn't even know that YouTube could be, like, a career for a musician. And at this point, I was, like, teaching a lot. And uh, shout out to my, my, my student, Colin, oh. who I saw in the comments there earlier. I was, I was teaching, yeah, I was teaching a lot. And I was doing, like, recordings and stuff like that, just trying to just get my foot in the door, doing whatever. And I really just used YouTube as a hosting space for some of the lessons I was doing, right? And there was one lesson in particular that I wanted to like really, it, like, it, it became my goal to make people understand that like, all right, there's, there's seven notes in a key and each of those notes become a chord. Like the, the first note is a major chord, B major, two is minor, three is minor, four is major, five is major, six is minor, seven is half diminished, you know, 
something that like I wish I would have been told myself instead of just trying to like randomly figure it out and stuff like that. And uh, I made like a, a video with like visuals and stuff that I would just be able to share with all my students because a lot of times you just need a visual with one thing for someone just to talk at you. But I just did that, made that, animated it, posted it on YouTube just so I would have a link that I could like share people. And it was public and eventually like people just kind of found it. And uh, I was like, oh, like people are actually seeing this. This could actually be something. And then I started just making one video a week. And I uh, kind of so blew up from it. was kind of the way in for you. Um, and that's one of the things that we like to celebrate here, too, is, you know, teaching not only, you know, technical um, and uh, fretboard type uh, things for, for performing artists, but also the care and maintenance of an instrument uh, as well. Um, I see you've got an acoustic there. So I've got to ask you, because everybody comes from kind of a different world. Now, I, I, you said you had, um, when you were doing your math flex, uh, guy who came into the room had a yes. acoustic uh, was that kind of your first love or did you want to get an electric first or what what's the balance there for you because i know everybody's got a different answer on the electric acoustic today yeah great yeah, all right so uh, my introduction was to acoustic but the first guitar i ever had was an electric it was like one of those like squire starcaster star kit things you know like a cheap rat happy type guitar with like little crappy amp and stuff like that so i was really more into electric at first because one of the reasons that i wanted to start playing guitar was i really got into like hendrix and zeppelin like most people do and i i think that even though those are like two of the greatest guitar players ever their playing is very accessible to beginners because at the heart of it they're kind of riff writers you know and like you can you can play riffs semi quickly. You can't play it like they did it, but you can play something recognizable to them. So electric was the first thing that kind of got me in. And then and then in college, I just really got heavy into Elliot Smith. Huh? And like Elliot's Elliot's my guy for life. So that's when I kind of made the full switch to acoustic. And then probably ever since then, uh, just one just realizing that acoustic guitar writing can be more than just open chords and stuff like that because his his playing I, I think he's the best ever so really really becoming a student in the school of Elliot Smith is kind of what made me an acoustic player probably we've got people in the comments that want to hear some playing can we point to that um, people are saying oh. yes we want to listen to okay everybody we hear you um, we're gonna take a quick pause here we're going to let Sean play a little bit because um, you're probably tired of hearing me talk. And let us uh, let us go to another type of flex, if you will, and have Sean's guitar do the talking for a moment. Then we'll kind of rejoin the conversation. How about that? Sounds great. So kind of picking up Charlie Smith, I remember one of the first songs that made me really, uh, that blew my mind on acoustic oh. guitar writing was Condor Avenue, which it kind of starts off like a... basis of that song is like a, there's it's chords you know it's just like an e minor to a d over f sharp to like these major kind of root major third type thing and like it's something like that that like that that kind of thing was like oh i all the cool stuff that like when you first start out and maybe you think of as like blues turnarounds that are fun to play. You, you know what I mean? Like uh like like stuff like that was like what like what I first started to play. Even though like blues music isn't something that I really ever listened to, but it was something that like was accessible from a playing standpoint. Uh I found the cool stuff about that in his writing. So in between these chords, you have all these like transitions, and uh, they're just they're just so good, and that's what really really drew me towards his playing and players like him is those transitional components between the open chords that make you know. Like that kind 
kind of stuff where it's like, that's really just A minor, F, and G. You know what I mean? But everything about his playing is transitional. You learn everything that you'll ever need to about like music theory and like what chords go with each other, what chords don't go with each other, chromatic medians. It's like everything that you'd ever want to learn kind of comes from that. And I think that was like the first artist that like really studying his music was like, oh, there's so. It, it, it just made all the, the mysticism become more accessible to me personally. And I've, I've just been kind of like in love with it and trying to trying to chase that feeling of like putting a puzzle together ever since like really getting into his music. And this is fun to play too. You know, it's like, it, it sounds harder to play than it is, which is like what everybody's looking for <laughs> from, a, from a trying to impress others standpoint. But it also is just very uh, validating like personally be like oh like i just that that turnaround of, like like it, in time at the speed of that song i had to drill that over and over and over again and i remember when i could finally get like a workable version of condor avenue to play it open mic or whatever i was like yes like i finally i finally did something one of the cool takeaways from that so, is um for people like me who are predominantly electric players and, and do the things that you were talking about earlier, the big the riffs and all that fun stuff, playing rhythm acoustic um, doesn't come naturally to me. But one of the things I pulled out of what you just said that can help anybody kind of in my situation is to focus on the transition and the passing notes in between chords. So you're not just chugging along doing the kind of campfire chords that I call them. Um, Find the notes that lead from one chord to another. Try to insert those in the in-between moments. You'll add a little bit more excitement, a little bit more variety, and you'll make it a little more interesting to play for yourself. So you're not getting as bored as well, just doing the chug it, chug it, chug it type thing. I think a lot of electric players get into that trap because they never really care too much about learning much acoustic. So they're like doing this begrudgingly because I have to, because we have like unplugged set or something. Um, little ways to work in kind of leading tones and passing tones in between those i think like you said is a really great way to um make people care and it made you interested in it and i think will make other people interested in maybe exploring their acoustic side more oh totally yeah i think that's so true because it's funny how it always kind of comes down to like oh are you an acoustic player or an electric player i'm like to me it's like they're really the same thing you know, you know what i mean like their role in a group might be different you know like if you're just kind of playing like muted power chord stuff or something like like i think a lot of people think of that as like an electric guitar thing but as someone who's like gigged a lot if it's just you responsible for the music like there's a time and a place for everything that you could learn on electric guitar and kind of put it in that world and and vice versa um, you know? i am located in new england i'm not sure where you're located at the moment. where where are you currently at you're i'm in florida, florida right now. i am are, are you you're in florida full-time or just for now most I'm back and forth between California a little so, bit, but most mostly a place, yeah. um, a place with probably I'm assuming a lot of humidity in the air. The correct assumption. But let's keep yes. talking about the insane amount and humidity. And you probably know where I'm going with this. Um, how do you personally maintain your instruments, or do you have any kind of tips or, or tricks for the folks watching? Um, who, who have acoustics and want to take care of them properly, especially when you're dealing with climate changes and humidity swings. And for me in the Northeast, it's all over the map. For you, it's probably maybe a little bit more consistent throughout the year. Um, what are you doing to keep your stuff in tip-top shape? Yeah, the nice thing about Florida is you don't have to worry about like treating a room like you did, because I, I went to high school and like college in, in Michigan. So I, I'm familiar with how like I would put my guitar in a room and come back to it and it's just tuned differently. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I do I do remember that. And like you hear horror stories about like guitars like cracking and stuff if you don't have like a humidity pack in in the case. But I don't really have to worry about that in Florida tonight. The, the one thing that you have to worry about is like putting your keeping your guitar in a car right when it's 
200 degrees out, <laughs> which, which, you know, people, people say that. I, and I'm such like, a, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm so lazy when it comes to like a lot of maintenance stuff. I'm just like, oh, don't, don't keep your guitar in a hot car. You better, you better not. You're going to pay, pay the price. And like, I'm like, whatever, whatever, dad, you know, shut up. You can't, you can't tell me what to do. And then I do it. And it's like, the guitar's fine, but then you look and the glue has melted, like holding it together. Yeah, and then it shifts and stuff like that. Like, like I used to play a, a, a Breedlove Passport 250 when I was teaching on the road and stuff. And like, to a certain extent, like you can't always get away with it. Like, I'm not the guy who's gonna take like my guitar into like the grocery store with me. Be like, I just I can't leave it outside for 10 minutes, you know? But, uh, you know, crack the doors open, or crack the windows a little bit. I pretend like it's a small dog, you know, because the the glue melted on that breed love, and then it just became a different shape eventually. So, so yeah, that's one thing that I just I didn't think about. It's like, yeah, the glue is holding these. Even even an awesome Taylor guitar is being held together with glue, and it will melt. If you subject it to, uh, you know, just being outside or in a car. Or I would space, imagine elliptic you know. strings probably help so your strings and fingerboard don't get all gross and corroded, um, you know. Oh, my gosh. That's 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 the main thing, actually, about here. Because uh, playing live, it, it, it's funny because, like, there's so many different schools of thought on, like, playing live. Like some people are like playing live and it's like, oh, it's like a 15, 20 minute opening set for like a touring band, which is like kind of awesome. But I think the reality for most like gigging music are like three, four hour sets, right? So, you know, when when we're playing a lot, like three, I'd be doing like three, three hour gigs per week. And some of these would be outside in Florida where I'm just, just wetting, right? And just like the the moisture from your hands, like I'm not even like I couldn't play anything but elixir strings. Like if if I had like a regular set of just like steel uncoated strings on there, they'd be shot in like one show. And I'm not even exaggerating. Like like you have to have like I I really settled on for the live stuff the custom light eleven coated nano web, just because like they could handle shows like that. And not just deteriorate and absorb all the all the moisture coming off yeah, of your hand, especially for you where you've got all that wetness in the air. Um, I remember touring through New England, and it was mm -hmm. it was a nightmare going through strings because they would just get so like corroded after after a set. Um, my flex is that I have bizarre pH balance in my hands, I guess, because I would eat through strings <laughs> in about a day. Your flex was much more intellectual, um, but or probably a, a hey, whatever where, where you need something like that. Um, Chunk, if you don't mind, we do have a couple questions um, here um, that I'd like to get to. Um, some of them came in uh, through social media. We, we, we asked people if they had any questions for you to submit those throughout the week uh, on our channels and, and through the electric channels. And we also have some that I've tried to copy and paste here. Um, I promise everybody we will hear more playing. Why don't we do a question, then a little bit more playing, and get back to some questions? Because everybody wants to just kind of listen, and I don't blame them. Um, if you've heard Sean before, you probably want to listen to him more than me talk. But let's do a question here. Someone wants to know, um, they've been playing okay. for a while. Um, they, they said they've been playing acoustic for a while. They've been uh, doing kind of some standard 12-bar blues stuff. They want to know if you have any tips to spice up what is essentially a formulaic um, type of playing. Now, we talked about how to kind of spice up. Um, you know, rhythm chords. What do you do for blues? You said you're not a huge blues guy, but I've heard some of your stuff on YouTube and you do get into it a bit. Any any tips there to kind of make things a little more interesting? Oh, of course. First of all, shout out to Mimi Sounds in the chat. What's up, Mimi? But uh, blues, so my, my take on blues stuff is to not be trapped by what people think of as the blues, right? Because like there are tons of non-blues songs that still follow that formulaic one, four, five pattern, or however you wanna, you know, kind of dice it up, whether it's twelve bars, sixteen bars, eight bars, whatever. But uh, I really think that thinking of just the root note first in like a twelve-bar blues, like instead of like a one, two, the four chord, 
the back to the one chord, and then the five chord, then the four chord, and then the turn around and start the whole thing again, back to one. Right? It's like, I, I get why that's kind of boring, but if you think of it just as like, all right, I'm, I'm starting on, I'm assuming this in A, right? And let's say it's A major. Instead of being like a one pattern, and again, and maybe a third time, and a fourth time, maybe think of those as four bars. Think of those as four opportunities to do something different in the same thing. Like maybe the first four count, you could do like a traditional like, octave flat seven five right so maybe that's like your first riff but then maybe the second time you could kind of octave it up like there's the first bar and that's kind of like all right I, I i did something i did that first riff and then maybe the second time i'm gonna just do like an octave and then back to the lower octave, just like an A to a G octave thing, right? Which would be the flat seven, which I've already revealed in that first riff, right? So there's my first bar, my second bar, and then my third bar could be the same thing again. And then maybe I just do something different. So then it's like, all right, I have, I have a theme that is like really, all right, guys, I'm here with the blues. That first bar is like, I'm here with the blues. Set the table, but then the second bar, you do something else. It could be as simple as just going from there to there. And then you come back to the blues. Because you always got to come back to the blues, Ben. You know, you know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't leave the blues behind. Right? You got to come back. Yeah, totally. That, you know, that's, that's the peaks and valleys of life, you know? But if, if you just left the blues, you wouldn't be interested. Okay? You'd be out on your super yacht just, like, chilling. No, you, you, go, you go back down. Your addictions take hold once again, and you come back to that, and then maybe explore kind of like every other or something like that. So I think that's a good way to think of every bar as an opportunity to do something different, and that is less of a, a limitation and more of like a challenge. I think that's what kind Number of like one, um, I would gladly go live on my yacht and give the blues. That's just anyway. Uh, number two, good takeaways here. Look at each of those bars as an opportunity and not a limitation. Don't feel like you're stuck into a standard formula that you can't break out of. Um, like Sean said, treat each one of those bars as a little segment that you can do something interesting in. Think of the root. Think of what you can do there and how that would relate to the music. And I'll say this as well. Um, anybody who wants to go back and rewind and listen to what Sean said and see his examples, we're going to archive this entire live stream on uh, YouTube and right here on the Elixir Instagram channel. So if you missed any of that, if you weren't taking notes, there will be an opportunity um, probably starting tomorrow morning or even right after we end here. Um, go back and see what he did. Look at where his fingers were positioned. He's in the key of A. See how he was treating each one of those bars as an individual musical statement, um, even while still retaining the overall structure of what we would consider a standard 12 bar blues. It's a really great way to approach not just the fretboard, but how you think of um, musical phrasing and chord transitions and, uh, you know, uh, a standard rigid structure that you can do something with. So, Sean, thank you very much for that. I think that was super helpful. And if nobody gets anything else out of this other than that last five minutes, I think that's worth the price of admission alone, which it's a free Instagram stream. So, no complaints. Uh, great, great info. Um, we did hear some playing, so everybody who's saying we want to hear Sean play some more, I think you just heard some really great yeah. stuff and some great information that you can take away. Um, Sean, we do have another question. Do you, do you mind if I read this one real quick here? So, um, sure, some people are saying they really appreciate, and this is more of an electric question, but I think you can answer it even with an acoustic in your hand. They really appreciate when you play your D'Angelico um, electric guitar, which I love, by the way, on your YouTube channel. If you're using the neck pickup, your tone is still crystal clear and not muddy. Uh, what, well, this person is saying, not muddy like I'm getting out of my neck pickup. Um, do you have any tips either on the guitar or through your amp slash rig on how to get a clear neck pickup sound? I like the neck pick Okay, they're going on. They like the neck pickup sound. It's great. But they feel maybe it's a little too muffled uh, tone-wise. What are you doing? Are you doing anything differently? Is it just the guitar? Is it how you have your tone control set? Your amp? What What are you doing there? 
get a clear sound. So that, that's a great question. And that's something that I never understood too. Because like, all right, I have the same gear as player X. How come that. I can't get it to sound? Yeah, yeah. Like, like come on, right? And especially with the, the D'Angelico stuff. You're right. The, the neck pickup on the D'Angelico is like what I think is their best thing. Now, what I will say about that is I think those are generally voiced a little more mid-range heavy, right? And uh, I, I would say that, like, I, I don't play with, like, an EQ pedal when I play the D'Angelico. I just play into a Supro uh, amp with it as well with those. And I usually have the EQ set pretty flat. You might want to actually boost the trouble on those because that is a very mid-range voice neck pickup. But I do think that technique really comes into that. And playing cleanly will actually remove muddiness from your, your playing. And that doesn't even mean that, like, it's, it's better playing or, or worse playing. But I think when you're first starting out, you know, your, your fingers might be able to, like, mute things. And, and, and muted string energy translates into kind of mid-range mud, I, I guess, in, in, in my opinion. And... I, I notice a big difference just when I'm playing finger style. Like if I play finger style with like versus with a pick. Yeah, the the attack of a pick really right whatever it is. Right? Like that's that's a great example. C major seven chord with your with the flesh of your thumb versus the pick. Right? It's like, it's a volume and a brightness and a tone thing. And my favorite thing on the D'Angelico specifically is kind of this finger style slappy technique that I kind of do where it's like, would be something that I think maybe resembles what my playing generally sounds like. So I think what that is, it's a combination of like, Using the pads of my fingers for some things, and then using the my nail to get a brightness, and that's, that's a technique that I just kind of accidentally kind of have owned for a while, because I do really like the sound of of mid range on acoustic guitars and electric guitars specifically. That's why I really gravitate towards the D'Angelico stuff because it has such a creamy mid range, as compared to the Fender stuff, which I love too. But I feel like the Fender stuff is very trebly. Like I always have to roll off whenever I'm, I'm playing a strap on the tone knob. But D'Angelico, I'm just tone on 10 all the time. And I think it's just a combination of, if you're playing finger style, use your, your nail on your striking hand to end phrases, right? So if I'm, if I'm playing finger style, you hear the end of it more than you hear the, the run up to it. And I think that kind of cleans up the sound a little more. I hope you were paying attention um, because that's a really great explanation. A lot of it does come down to actually how you're playing and the articulate nature, especially of how you're either picking with the pick or your fingers and nails uh, in tandem. Um, I found personally, and I think Sean has echoed this, a lot of neck pickup muddiness comes down to people like me being sloppy and just kind of hammering. On a bridge pickup with a lot of game, that sounds great. That's rock and roll. Uh, on a neck pickup, you're not going to get away with as much slop uh, as you might otherwise, um, you know, depending on your, your guitar. So, again, we're going to archive this whole conversation. Go back and listen to what Sean just said. There's a lot of words of wisdom in there for electric and acoustic players. Um, and, uh, again, watch his hands and watch his picking hand in particular. Um, if you pick up on some of these techniques, I think it'll really help um, your playing as well. Um, Sean, I think we've got time here. I really want you to play. Why don't we do this? We've got time if Sean uh, is a willing participant. Maybe we'll listen to a little bit more of his beautiful playing. We'll one final question after oh that, um, and then we'll do our final round. Thank you. Sean, is that is that okay with you? Sure, perfect. I'll, you know, I'll do kind of an example of what I was just talking about. And maybe so this is a new song I'm working on, and maybe you, you can pick out where I'm changing my, my playing from, right? So this is going to be a lot of open chords, and then some kind of other techniques too. So it starts out with an E major.
So I think it's kind of an example of food, the difference between a pick and your fingers and the tones um, and stuff you can get. Let's let's maybe pause there for a second before we forget. Um, Sean, I know you're all over the internet, all over social media. Where's the best place for people to find you? So you've got a ton of educational content, both on your website and, and YouTube and everything. Um, where can people get a hold of you and, and find that information? Just YouTube, that's the name, Sean Daniel, uh, S E A N. Uh, no, no S on Daniels, Daniel, singular. And uh, yeah, there's, there's thousands of YouTube videos, so it was okay, a good yeah, time. I got something out of this particular video. Just know that there's a, a, a fountain of information that Sean has provided um, through his various channels. We do have one quick question that sort of relates to this, um, and, and it's about your YouTube channel and, and content creation in general. Um, the question has come in, how do you stay motivated to create content every day? I think that's a relevant question, not only to the content creator, someone who's on video and, and is sharing their personality with the world, but also songwriters and musicians um, to stay motivated, even if they're not on camera. Any, any tips or words of wisdom that you can share with folks? Man, that's a that is that's the ultimate question, is it not? Uh, like how do you stay motivated with, with anything? I think I'm in a very fortunate position where I have uh, an awesome audience that is overwhelmingly supportive and uh, hearing positive comments. And I read all my YouTube comments. It it definitely is a great uh, kind of boost in confidence to keep going and just being supported by like your peers and like your followers and stuff like that. And uh, a lot of people say, well, well, you know, the internet is such an evil place. <laughs> like, like, the, like the detracting comments are actually my favorite. So I think a lot of it is really just the mindset that everybody's kind of doing their own thing. It's like if people vibe with what you're doing, take all the good parts of that. And then if other people are hating on it, just kind of see that for what it is. Like one of the things I, I do weekly is like the read salty comments that I get which is like my favorite part of the whole gig. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah, like just uh, just reading. <laughs> Someone said I'm, a, I'm Seinfeld with the guitar. I prefer to be Larry David with the guitar, <laughs> if we're being honest, <laughs> but I'll take it. I'll take the Seinfeld with the guitar. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I just taking the good feedback for what it is and taking the criticism for what it is, which usually they're coming from two totally different places. And uh, I don't know, just being confident in what you're doing as long as you're having a good time, just keep following that thread. And and it'll lead you to being on the Elixir Strings live stream. Your dream is also uh, to be uh, a guest on the, on the upcoming episode of Gear Speak. Um, stay motivated, read the salty comments. Um, maybe you'll get something out of them. I think Sean maybe has a cheerier disposition about the negative um, than someone like he does. Uh, I've seen some of the comments on our YouTube channel, and um, oh boy, we prefer humanity sometimes. But um, that said, do maybe look on the brighter side of life, as uh, the good folks in Monty Python once said. Sean, I want to uh, just extend a, a, a gratitude towards you, a, a huge thanks to um, you for, for joining us here on the Elixir channel. Um, there was a lot of really great practical uh, information and tips that I think a lot of musicians um, can glean from this. Like I said, we will be archiving this um, both here on the Elixir Instagram channel, also on the Performer Magazine YouTube channel. So if you head over to our YouTube, uh, just search for Performer Magazine, you'll see not only this archive probably uh, starting within the next 24 hours, but also some previous Gear Speak episodes too. So you can check out some of the guests that we've talked to in the past, see what kind of uh, tips they've uh, been able to relay uh, in, in these chats. Um, I kind of think of them as our little fireside chats with, with folks in the industry. Uh, and stay tuned uh, for more in the future from us. Um, Sean, is there anything that you want to end on uh, before we sign off here? No, just uh, thanks everybody for having me. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Get Elixir Strings, like I said, I've, I've there's probably no other product that like I tried for the first time and was like, I'll never switch. Like this is just this is just it for me. Yeah? Like it's like the stickiest product because once you go elixir, it's like you just you just don't go back. Like, you know? like I do, uh, you've got to restring them all and 
Alexis lasts a long time. So for me, uh, it's great here in the studio. You can see my Firebird behind me. That's got a new set of 9 to 46s. Uh, I use the OptiWebs. Um, they feel a little bit more natural to me. I also do like the NanoWebs and the PolyWebs. Um, I like the slicker coating sometimes uh, on, on my strats. Um, but yeah, I've got new elixirs on this Firebird here in the studio. That'll last me a while. Um, Sean, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Everybody, go look for Sean on, on YouTube and his website and all the various platforms. Go check out that educational content. It's awesome. It's super, uh, super helpful to anybody out there who maybe just needs Got a shout out. I got a shout out, my man, my man Davidas in the chat. The most, the, the second most handsome guitar YouTuber out there. What up, well, Davi? I mean, we're surrounded buddy. by handsome, handsome people here on the on the chat today. I would say. Uh, thank you, of Sean. Yes. Thank you to everybody watching. And if you want to replay this later, it will be up. Uh, but until next time, that's it for us. My name is Ben. I'm the editor of Performer Magazine. Thank you so much to Elixir for allowing us to host here yet again, and uh, catch you on the next one. Bye.